Cool, okay. <laughs> Hi, <laughs> thanks everyone. Um, yeah, so as Nina said, uh, we're gonna have three participants uh, to the panel today. I'm gonna be your moderator. Um, my name is Laura Gaetano. I'm a designer and a developer. Um, and as of recently, sorry? Oh. <laughs> as of recently, um, I was leading the program Rails Girls Summer of Code and working at Travis Foundation, where my focus was on diversity and inclusion in tech, but uh, more specifically in open source. And I've got three panelists uh, here with me today. Um, I'm going to very briefly introduce them and then ask them to also introduce themselves in case I've forgotten anything. Um, so uh, starting with... Frank uh, Kalicek, who might not need an introduction, um, but I'll say it anyway. He's the founder of Nextcloud and uh, currently the managing director as well. Um, then we have Jessica Green, who is a developer at um, Ecosia. Is that how it's pronounced? Yeah. Um, and also the organizer of Pi Ladies Berlin and of open source diversity. Um, and finally, uh, Princia Sequera. Um, who is a Mozilla tech speaker, the maintainer of the Firefox, uh, Firefox dev tools, debugger, and a prototype fund fellow. Um, yeah, so I'll, before we get started, I'll ask uh, maybe all of you to briefly also introduce yourselves and talk a little bit about what um, your personal kind of perspective or basically why you're here on the panel today talking about uh, diversity and inclusion in open source. Um, Frank, do you want to start? Sure. Yeah, first of all, thanks um, for having me here. Um, it's a very important topic, I think, um, that we should actually cover more at uh, conferences and um, we have to work on to improve the current situation. Um, my personal um, situation is that I'm uh, an open source fan and developer for a long time, like 20 years, um, and actually something that I really, really liked at the very beginning that it is an, an international um, movement that you have like people from all over the world, um, which is something I always liked. But of course, it doesn't mean um, that it's um, diverse as it should be. Um, we all know that it's, of course, um, dominated by white men, basically. <laughs> and, um, and that's something um, that we have to improve because I don't think anyone nowadays questions that a diverse um, team is a better team. So, um, yeah, I'm happy to be here and uh, to just discuss this topic and um, maybe um, improve the current situation a little bit together. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I think it's very special for me to be here uh, because one year ago I was also at the Next Cloud conference, as uh, some of you may remember, uh, and that was because I had been contributing to Next Cloud as part of the Rails Girls Summer of Code program um, because I was retraining to become a developer. Uh, and it's one year on, I can say I am still a developer uh, <laughs> and it's going really well. And I think that foundation of being able to work on a product like Nextcloud with the community that's surrounding it really helped uh, in, in that journey. Yeah, I think everything else you said was pretty spot on. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Princia and thank you for having me here, Nextcloud, and thank you Laura for the introduction. So all that Laura mentioned is what I do in the evening, so like, yeah, when I get free time, so all the things related to open source. So as a day job, I am a lead engineer at Smart Helios, a company into health sector. And what is important to me is me uh, being and underrepresented minority in tech. I have had so many uh, difficulties to get into tech, to get into open source. And whenever I can, I like to offer my time to advocate for diversity and inclusion. So thank you for uh, having me part of the panel. Awesome, thank you. Um, maybe we could just start right away with kind of one big question, which is, um, like, what's the hardest part of becoming an open source contributor? Um, and why, I guess, is it difficult? Um, and maybe we could look at 
different perspectives. So starting with you maybe as a person um, from, mar from a marginalized group or several marginalized groups. Right. Um, so one of the hardest problems of contributing to open source is time. Um, and the other thing is um, the non-paid version of open source, right? So we all have to maintain our day jobs, and um, it also gets uh, difficult if the company does not support open source or open source contributions in general. So the first criteria is time. Then I think I would jot it down to personal preference. So a person who wants to contribute to open source, no matter, will find time and uh, get there. But the other difficulties come with uh, being a woman, uh, if you have a family, how you have to maintain other things which cater around to being um, this, um, uh, yeah, this uh, minority. The other things are also the vast selection of open source projects, the tech stack available there. So if you are a first time contributor, it will, it can get overwhelming to find the right project, to find the right uh, issue to get into. Um, so it's, it's not easy, it's overwhelming. Um, and um, I think it does need time to, uh, go through all the projects to really find what matches you, and then it's it's also about the community, right? So the community needs to welcome open source contributors. So the community needs to know where you stand, and uh, if you're not comfortable, then the community needs to be welcoming enough to tell, okay, we uh, welcome first time contributors. So there has to be a support network around this. So. Uh, all of these things, when it's there, it's it's good to get started. But when it is missing, then it can get um, it can be a big barrier uh, for entry into open source. Yeah, I mean everything you said. I think the only thing I would add on top is uh, representation as well. I think what we see in some of the community groups is there's a lot more engagement. Uh, for people when they see a project that is maybe run by someone who they can identify with. Um, so I think that's something we are trying to achieve uh, with the Berlin chapter of open source diversity with Jan, who spends a lot of his time on the project. We're really trying to highlight and emphasize the projects um, by people from underrepresented or marginalized groups because I think that helps in general get more people into the topic of open source and see it as a possibility for themselves. Yeah, good point. Um, yeah, I also agree with you that I think time is probably a very important factor. So, um, I mean, I was involved in a, in a KDE project, which is an, one of the biggest open source projects um, like since 20 years. and But it was basically came out of Germany, and they are basically, um, well, computer science students, men, of course, also. And I think um, over time, I, and together with others, try to reach other areas. We organize conferences in other places of the, of the, of the, of the planet um, to, to reach more people, to become more diverse. But it become really clear that the, 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 that cultural differences, for example, in, um, in Germany, we are still in the good situation that we have um, that um, there are no university fees and actually um, a lot of people can study and also the study is usually or not often allows that you have time for something else beside your study. And this is where a lot of the open source developers, this is why Europe or Germany is so strong in open source, because they actually have people who have time for that. And if you go to other um, places, um, I really, I had to learn this over time. It's really completely different. I mean, the US, for example, open source conference in the US, where I also go, go a lot, they're completely different. They don't have a lot of volunteers. It's completely business driven. Like conferences like FOSTEM, for example, that don't exist like that in the US. And there are other places, of course, like in, in, um, in Asia, um, the FOSS Asia people doing a great job, by the way, or in, in, in India, where um, people definitely don't have any time to just do open source as a hobby. I mean, they have to fight for um, to sustain their life, and for them it's part of the education. 
So for them, basically, it has to be part of education to have time to contribute to, to open source. So it's, 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 really, it's really different. But I think time is a very important factor. It's a, it's a luxury to be able to spend many, many hours um, a week um, on open source, non-paid open source. Yeah, so there's been like a lot of very great points that you've all made. And I think, so there's a couple of things that I would like to kind of touch upon. So one is obviously time and the idea that maybe as a community or as, a, as an industry, we maybe need to be better about thinking about how we can perhaps fund open source work as well, or how we can implement open source work into our day paid job so that it becomes a part of our work and so that it's not kind of a hobby that we do on the side. I think that's really important. Um, but since we're um, today at a, at a community event um, and since Nextcloud is, I think, has been pretty great um, at kind of trying to bring in more people from underrepresented groups or trying to support them, I'd love to talk a little bit about the focus or the importance of a great community when it comes to inviting people from underrepresented groups. And so perhaps, um, Jessica, um, since you were a contributor or started as a contributor last year, maybe you can talk a little bit about your experience and what that was like, and perhaps what things from the Nextcloud community and from the Rails Girls um, Summer of Code project um, helped you to kind of feel welcomed and invited into the community. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I felt really nervous and intimidated <laughs> when I first attended uh, Nextcloud uh, Hack Week uh, in Stuttgart. Uh, first day walking in with uh, two women, uh, who one of which was my partner during Rails Girls Summer of Code, and um, there only being one other woman, which was Camilla, who was our mentor uh, <laughs> in the room, was intimidating. Like. Um, it took a little while to like start to really feel part of the community. Uh, but what was really awesome is after that week or after a few days of the week, I really got to know more of the people that are involved in the community and did feel welcomed in that way. And I do feel like Nextcloud, although uh, maybe still not having the most uh, diverse contributing group, uh, is really putting that uh, in a priority. Um, I'm sure you you want to do more, but I, I think it's it's important to also, you know, kind of um, highlight those uh, motivations that are there. I think um, it's something that is really special about Rails Girls as a program itself, because um, when you're learning to program, I feel like there's an overwhelming amount of boot camps and scholarship schemes um, that you can apply for. Uh, I think something that I didn't even realize the value of uh, Rails Girls Summer of Code was this opportunity to work on a product with other people, other people who were distributed uh, all around Germany and further afield. This was definitely a huge advantage for when I had my first job uh, because it gave me the chance to be able to communicate with other people about my code, uh, which you just you don't get if you're working on self projects or you're working on a project maybe with like three friends. So I think um, there is a lot of work to be done, but there's a lot of, uh, you know, really people that find it important are willing to prioritize it and make space uh, for more diverse contributors. I think this is something we all have to get used to um, because it is an uneven playing field. And like the question around time isn't the same for everyone. Like you were pointing out, if you're some sort of caregiver, which in, in a lot of societies, not all, but is predominantly uh, for women, then it's, it's not like having like an hour or two hours every evening. Something I think that is an approachable way of doing it is something we also try to do with Open Source Diversity in Berlin is have events where people can come and contribute. So it's like a time boxed uh, thing where you know you're gonna come for a day, but by the end of the day, you'll have made a contribution. I think this is a really good way to get people into it because you need that sense of achievement to engage with it. I think if the community is great, then you might keep coming, but you also need to kind of see the reward of what the work is you're putting in. Yeah, so kind of like low hanging fruit um, and kind of the possibility to contribute right away so that you 
get like that reward, that feeling of like being rewarded for your effort. Um, so you talked a little bit also about representation and the mm -hmm. fact that representation is important. And um, I'm wondering, like, did any of you, and this was also a question that I had for uh, Printia specifically, um, but did you have any mentors throughout your career? And particularly, do you think that it's important to have mentors that are like you and kind of look like you and that yeah that are basically like role models um for for your career um yeah for sure i can tell that mentorship is very important um and i would not restrict the statement only to tech right so um, i think mentorship comes as a natural process so as we grow, we have parents or our immediate guardians as mentorship. We may, uh, they may not appear as mentors to us, but they are there to guide us. And this is very important for a kid uh, or a child as, as the child is growing. Um, it, it's a similar thing in tech or open source. So things can be very overwhelming given um, the size of the industry itself. So when I started into tech, I did have a mentor, so uh, I come from India, and I started uh, working as a startup. And uh, back then, I had uh, so much negative things to not join a startup because you wouldn't know uh, which direction your career would go. But I was lucky enough to have landed here because it was a small team, and there was so much scope to learn. And the person, the CEO or the co-founder here, uh, was so nice, and uh, to have guy uh, to be. Um, telling me all the things that is necessary, what is good, how to write good code, or like how to think, mainly uh, have this problem-solving skills, or just talk about life, you know. Um, uh, uh, and he also uh, mentioned why it is important to have a goal in life, so that um, having a goal in life is very important, so that it will help you uh, to see the future future yourself so uh, you go to a meetup you go to an event having a goal in mind always back of mind um, lets you talk to the right people talk uh, may, um, uh, helps you make the right connections and then somehow um, it will uh, let you connect the dots so uh, this this part is really important and uh, uh, similarly mentorship is also important important and um, for open source itself in 2017 i did my open source internship with outreachy and uh, outreachy is a paid uh, remote three month paid uh, open source internship and uh, i think this was really great for me to get into open source itself so in 2017 when i did this internship i was not new to coding i was not new to tech but I was new to open source, so I was forever getting stuck about what projects I wanted to select, where do I make my first pull request, or you know, uh, whom do I reach out to. And this uh, program came in handy, and it, it was good. So you also get a mentor during these three months, and um, the good thing is there is also the money, money here. Um, and um, yeah, uh, so this this is like I would say mentorship is really important, and after that. Um, I uh, volunteer my time wherever possible to uh, mentor others if they want to get started with open source or um, in my company, um, I have the privilege now to hire people or to hire juniors specifically and offer them mentorship. So this is also like, you know, using my privilege to offer mentorship and uh, my colleagues really like this and uh, we use open source for sure. So I also tell, uh, sometimes my colleagues complain, oh, okay, we use this library, and this library does not work. So uh, the advice I give them is, instead of complaining, or open up an issue, like, you know, just create an issue uh, on GitHub, or even why not just create a pull request. So this is like, you know, the things what we can give back to the community. And uh, in return, I think these, these are all things, it's like, you know, it's coming... Um, through mentorship, right? So I had this mentorship. I knew where, um, um, how I started, and now I'm just taking this uh, mentorship forward. So yeah, I think it's it's very important. It helps you, uh, Jessica, Frank. Do you have uh, any? Uh, 
yeah, any stories that you'd like to share also on the topic or do you yeah. want to refer back to something that Prince um, has said? First of all, I think it's also good to acknowledge that like mentorship in itself is a skill and not everybody, it's something you have to train also of like how to be a good mentor, how to listen to someone, how to be able to give constructive feedback. Um, and often I think we take for granted that, yeah, of course, everyone can do this they can all be a mentor but I think that's something you also uh, need training for so I think it's really important um, if you're working in a company or if this is something that you would like to give back to the community that you kind of reach out and it's fine to be like I don't really know how to mentor someone um, for example for me I recently um, was doing a feedback session for someone that was going to give a talk at one of our uh, community events and Afterwards, my co-organizer said to me, you just gave her way too much feedback. She is not going to be able to process that, and the talk is on Tuesday. And I, I have to say, it was true. Uh, it was, I saw the talk uh, at the event, which was only four days after this feedback, and unfortunately, she had tried to incorporate a lot of the points I had said, and I felt it was to the detriment. So I think this is something we're all working on as well. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say is because you asked about um, is it beneficial if your mentor uh, is someone that is uh, similar to yourself? Um, I, I don't think that is true. I, I don't think that is a leading factor. Uh, quite a few of the mentors that I've had in tech uh, have been uh, men and I, they've really been able to support me. Um, I think having safe spaces like Pie Ladies uh, where I can go and kind of connect with other women in tech is really important because we do have a slightly different experience. Um, but also some of the conversations that I have with men in tech uh, where we like kind of, you know, discuss the differences in our experience, I think is super valuable as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's a very good point. And maybe, yeah, Frank yeah. can add something to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, of course, I completely agree that... Uh, Mentoring is super important. This is something that needs to happen more um, in all areas. But I think it might be especially hard or unusual in IT because, um, I mean, there's in, in IT, there is, I, f I feel that there is like in the core, there are a lot of people which is like, the, we have more introvert people probably. We have the more people in IT who don't really like to communicate too much. Um, this is popular here. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know. I mean, like, for example, conferences like that. I mean, f for me personally, it was, I, I worked like on IT things for, I don't know, 10 years or longer before I attended the first conference. Right? And also, like, okay, if I'm a little bit older than I am, <laughs> I still remember a time before the internet. Right? I mean, uh, I did software development for many, many years before the internet. There was no, there's no, there was not chatting or video calling. There was no forum. There was no uh, searching for something. It was sitting in front of a computer with a book and trying stuff out for your own. Right? There was no mentor. Right? There was only me as a nerd in the basement. <laughs> right? And this is still in the core, in the in the, in the core of a lot of communities. This way of working. And of course, if you want to improve the situation, uh, we need to communicate better. We need to bring in more mentors and so on. But this is, might be a special challenge for IT to move forward here. I mean, do you think that as an industry, we put way too little focus and emphasis on other skills beyond code? Because I think that's maybe also an like a bit of an issue? Arguably not enough emphasis on skills outside of code. Um, I think actually I've heard a lot of uh, arguments against mentorship come from this, well, that's not how I learned because when I learned that didn't exist and I totally uh, accept and recognize that that, but it was a different time period. I think now technology is moving a lot quicker if people are starting in the industry later. Um, I think... <laughs> It's, it's, it's not fair to be like, oh, you should have to like own your right uh, to, to be in here. Um, I think it's only fair to say that we can help everyone have that like foot up. Not that I for a minute think that's 
what you're saying, but it's just no, often I, I hear this. Maybe I should clarify. I don't want to say it, <laughs> that this is, this is not uh, how it should be. I just said this is how it was, and maybe also yeah. especially like for me or the people I knew at the time. But I mean, of course, as IT is also getting a lot bigger now, and we have want to be diverse and want to grow and uh, attract more people. And we also have the tools nowadays, right? We have like... We have like the communication tools to do it, which we should, should use, and also we have like also a way to make money with IT, which then enables conferences, and we can then pay for travel to come together and so on. So this is just a lot of opportunities we have today, and we should use that. So I'm not go I no, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. I don't want to go back to the old times. Definitely not. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it's also though. Um, um, sorry, I'm like ten. But it's also like a mindset uh, as well of uh, kind of you know. Um, I do think that we don't uh, value enough non-code uh, skills. I think they're often just kind of assumed to be there in in certain areas of development, and in others, it's fine that they're not. Uh, which I think is another discussion of like how do we help people advance those skill sets as well because as you said the industry does have a lot of people who feel more introverted who feel that some of these uh, non-code superpowers as we call them at Pi Ladies uh, <laughs> are something that they find very unapproachable or they don't know how to kind of develop those skills I think we can help there a lot and uh, for example another thing of you're saying you know how can we maybe reach out and help people contribute to open source well if you're working in the company and you come across a situation like you were saying where it's you see something in open source library that could be fixed maybe you even know how to do the fix so you would just open a PR grab a colleague who is a junior or someone else in the company and do it with them uh, or support them to make that contribution because I think that will help them also get in that mindset of like, oh, I can actually fix this just because it's not in our code base. Yeah. Did you, uh, so Princey as a maintainer maybe of a project, um, do you have any things, so I guess I have two questions. Like one is kind of going back to the idea of code versus non-code contributions. Do you notice that you have, you know, more contributions that are specifically code or and, and less contributions that are, I don't know, design or documentation or, you know, marketing, um, those types of contributions? So that's, I guess, my first question. My second question is, is there anything that you've tried to do as a maintainer to kind of maybe encourage other types of contributions? Or are there things that as, as open source kind of community members we can do in order to encourage more people who aren't programmers, aren't developers, aren't coders to contribute to open source? Right, uh, for this DevTools project itself, um, uh, sadly, uh, currently the uh, repository is currently not much active on GitHub because um, uh, with the recent launch of Firefox, few things are not compatible what used to work on GitHub. So most of the development has now shifted to Mozilla Central. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, people still command uh, file bugs uh, if they notice or um, still try to uh, open small pull requests, which will then be transitioned on the Mozilla Central uh, repository. But to answer the first question about documentation, we do uh, we did used to get a lot of contributions uh, mainly to uh, improve the README or the overall uh, documentation of the whole DevTools uh, architecture or the different components itself. So I think it was, again, a preference of people, what they used to like. Um, and uh, the next question was uh, what um, we as a community did to bring um, more non-code contributions. So this was about um, making everyone included, right? So the first step as a community uh, thing, we need to identify that we can get diverse contributions and 
how do we value these diverse contributions, so code versus non-code, so treat everything equally. Most of the time what happens is code contributions are taken like, oh yes, you know, this is like the real needed thing and the soft skills or the documentation are considered low priority. So we as a community, as maintainers, first have to realize that no matter what, uh, no matter what kind of contribution comes in, everything has to be valued. So this has to be always there in the mind of the community, especially in the mind of maintainers. And then I think it gets easier to accept any kind of contributions. The next thing, um, we also try to improve the language specific things. So what we realized was in the Slack channel, when people used to talk, sometimes, you know, not everyone was a native English speaker. So sometimes emotions or the vocabulary was lost. And uh, people, yeah, tried, uh, felt intimidated by, um, you know, some comments, uh, especially when it came from men. Uh, and then we tried to encourage like an inclusive language. So, you know, a period would be like, you know, um, ending a sentence w with a period is always considered a bit harsh. So maybe uh, end a sentence with a smiley or with dot, dot, dot. So it, it, it like, I think it, it all, um, uh, these, these little kind of things bring in a lot of emotions and it makes you um, talk further or like, you know, makes, uh, helps. Um, uh, someone else make the next move. So other than uh, documentation or non-code related things, we were also particularly uh, thinking about a language, how we speak, and then um, we tried uh, to have some automated bots uh, into Slack. So whenever a new member joined, so there was this bot which used to translate in different languages uh, in, in the language that they preferred, uh, or just um, this bot would come and um, help them, okay, so here are the good first bugs, bugs, and here is the documentation, you know, so it's, it's all giving this personal touch. So even as a maintainer or um, a person um, who writes solely code, uh, it was very important for us to target all these uh, different things. And um, it became very interesting when it came, uh, things about uh, when contributions came, uh, when naming the variables, right? So uh, people who were non-native contributors, uh, the way they used to name things uh, would matter, especially uh, native speakers. And we, we just said, ignore those things. It, it just does not break anything. So there is a variable name. It is descriptive enough. So uh, incomplete versus incomplete. How critical is that, like, you know, to taunt the first time contributor with these kind of minor grammatical settings. So, all these things, um, uh, it also adds to uh, to your um, code-related contributions as well, you know, just to ignore all the grammatical issues. So it just does not, just does not harm anybody. And for a first-time contributor, when the first-time contributor has bypassed all these issues and a first-time contributor sees a pull request getting merged, be in terms of documentation or be in terms of code, I think this can be a huge win. And as already mentioned here, that uh, self-satisfaction is, I think, what we have to guarantee uh, the first-time contributor. And uh, once this is done, then I think all the other things uh, flow, flow in together. It becomes easy. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think you're definitely right in saying that like language and how we use language is like a huge part of how we include or exclude people. Um, I have like a quick, uh, short, short, brief example that I often use in my talks, which is that we use Slack for our communication with Rails Go Summer of Code. And we also have a Slack bot. And when people use the word guys, which... A lot of people say guys is gender neutral, but it's not gender neutral. And so the Slack bot kind of like gently suggests um, other, other words that can be used instead of the word guys to like address everyone that are more kind of gender, gender inclusive. And I think um, even though sometimes people see that as a little bit of like a passive aggressive thing, uh, but it's a good way it's a good way to kind of hint in the direction of like the type of language that we want to use. And also I think um, what I've heard some people say is like, 
people are more likely to get angry at another person than they are to get angry at a bot. And so if you use a bot to kind of like translate um, what you actually want to tell the person, it just makes it easier because people will not be getting angry at the bot, but they might get angry at the person who says, hey, guys is not gender neutral. Um, yeah. And uh, the, I think um, we also try to do some community calls around uh, listing a topic in a non-native English itself with like a complete foreign script and about how like native speakers like you know could see it. So there was, and then it's it's all about creating awareness, right? It's it's all about um, building um, into. I think it's it's about. Uh, Broadening the mindscape, uh, bro broadening the um, yeah, broadening the horizon, and uh, yeah, this community call was very well taken when um, we had some title in a foreign script, and then our point was, you know, this is how uh, non-native speakers feel when things are, you know, when uh, hard coded, and uh, we are meant to follow uh, the native uh, English guidelines. And the next thing I think uh, always comes in hand to have a very, very uh, well-written code of conduct. So I think this is very important when you run an open source community. So having a well-written code of conduct, uh, not just having a code of conduct, it's very important to enforce it. And uh, I think um, this is uh, very important and um, Whenever people see this is being enforced, I think uh, people feel uh, comfortable around it. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I think maybe this is like also a good leeway into like a topic that I wanted to briefly talk about. I think before we slowly wrap up the panel, um, which is on the topic of like allyship. So kind of if I look around the room here, <laughs> a lot of people are... Like, there's a lot of men in this room. There's a lot of white men um, for kind of the people who are watching from the live stream, perhaps. Um, and so I think a lot of us, and even I would speak, if I speak for myself, like I, as a white, able-bodied woman um, who is also straight, I have a lot of privilege. And so there are a lot of things that I can do as an ally to actually support people who are more marginalized than me. Um, and I guess my question is to, like, all of you, but maybe more specifically to people who see themselves more as allied than members of underrepresented or marginalized groups. Um, what can we do to support the people who are more marginalized than us? Listen, I guess. Like, listen is the first thing. I mean, I think we can all be allies of each other as well, like you said. I think there's different... Uh, privileges that everybody has but I think the main thing is to make space and listen to people to other people yeah I think yeah you're right <laughs> Frank do you have something else that you would like to no, I mean, share or no, I'm not sure there are like a lot of good things already mentioned here I'm not sure I can add, add something here um, I mean the challenge is is just that it's sort of a as we know, I guess, it's a lot of a death cycle in a way that you have like um, like underrepresented groups that are underrepresented, then uh, they don't feel like invited in some areas like in IT and specific community or company or in IT in general um, because they are underrepresented. And um, of course, then they also don't like study like maybe computer science and focus on other things. And um, then the companies they have like trouble finding the people, basically because they are the less qualified um, job um, people there, basically because they don't study this, they study something else. And then this is a death cycle, basically, and leads again to this to the situation that they're mainly white men here, and somehow we have to break this cycle. Right? That's like the challenge, um, and that's also unfortunately takes a lot of time because it's done something to do with the education which is you don't change in a day right it's a decision of your life um, so this takes a lot of lot of work from all of us for a long time to to change this mindset and then basically hopefully improve the situation but I, I can say also like as xCloud um, I mean we really <laughs> we really want to hire other people than white men but it is tough basically and we need to change basically 
we have to change um, the culture so that um, more people feel invited to go into this space and then hopefully um, yeah, practice this test cycle. But it's uh, something that is not, not easy and will definitely take some time. But I, I also want to say that I think we are in a good way and a good track here. Um, I, I really like that in the IT industry and open source that, that we have discussions around that, that we have panels like that, there's awareness around it. I think there are a lot of other areas which, whereas other areas where they don't even talk about it, right? I mean, there is like, I don't know if you move into politics or a lot of other areas where it's really a similar bad situation. But I don't see a lot of panel discussions like that in other areas. So I really am really positive that I think that together we can improve the situation step after step and then hopefully in a, in a few years have a way better um, situation than today. Yeah. I don't know if I'm as hopeful, but <laughs> I, I think... Um, I've been trying to go to a lot of uh, meetups and talk to people from more marginalized groups. And I think it's really about like making space for them. So, you know, good intentions are great, but if they're not implemented, it really doesn't mean anything. Um, people want action. They, they want to see that it's meaningful. Um, there is plenty of people of color and plenty of women who can work in tech, but they're still not getting the jobs. There's plenty of people that, there's plenty of women that study uh, computer science and don't end up in the field. It's not only tech. I worked in the film industry for five years. Uh, I worked in the coffee industry for five years. Um, it isn't the same everywhere. There's cultural differences. I, I think in India, from the people I've spoke to there, there are more uh, women that at least study in the field of technology. In Albania, yeah. I've met a group of uh, female technologists. Um, in England, I would say I was discouraged from technology while I was at school. Not that it wasn't absolutely possible, but I felt, well... I, maybe it's also teacher-specific, let's say. Um, but I think the people are out there. I think it's we need to make more meaningful um, or we need to like be good on our promises and not only have discussions about diversity and inclusion but make real action on it and listen to the people who it affects. The good news is, ultimately, it's better for everybody. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it's true. It helps us all. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, if I can then add to that, like I think... If there's definitely one thing that I've noticed um, that I can do is also kind of amplifying because listening is great, but then, um, you know, if the, as an example, like if the great um, person of color on Twitter has, you know, 200 followers and I have 2,000, um, I can ultimately like push their message. Um, and so I think that is also something that is our responsibility and it's something that um, we've sort of heard like throughout the day, the, today's talks, right? Like this idea of like, if you don't do anything, then you're um, complicit in whatever happens. Like if you don't amplify the, the message and if you don't amplify the voices of people who are more mar marginalized, then you're also kind of complicit in this whole um, cycle that we're talking about. Like we... Um, amplify the voices of people who aren't marginalized, we end up hiring them, and then th the cycle continues. And so we need to break that cycle. So I think um, thinking a lot about our privilege and thinking about how we can use it for good is maybe like one thing that we can definitely do, as well as listening. Um, yeah, and, and I mean, you can all just think in your local circle, like at Pi Ladies, we have a gender policy, which is like a plus one policy. So we actually have quite a few members of Pi Ladies who identify as male. Uh, and we, I think, have very interesting content. So they really want to come to our meetups. But we say, please bring a female plus one, uh, because that helps us kind of ensure that we keep our like minimum 50% of female attendees, but also it kind of widens the circle of people who know about it 
maybe we can do something similar for the next next cloud conference of you know bringing a plus one if we need yeah i think that's a for them. i think Let's that's a great too, suggestion <laughs> we've got enough seats so yeah i don't know if uh, yours is somewhere listening and taking notes but <laughs> okay great <laughs> um yeah maybe uh, to kind of wrap it up do you have like we've talked about, we've touched on so many topics, like we talked about um, sort of what we can do with our privilege. We talked about the issues with um, time uh, in, in contributing to open source and like diverse uh, contributions and how the, our hiring is broken in our industry. Um, before we wrap up, like do you have any last kind of words of wisdom for the audience or maybe a resource that you would recommend um, if people want to educate themselves because education is maybe also like a good um, I would like to say um, to in continuation to the last question diversity is good uh, it's good to know that is a problem and it's good to work towards it but the main problem Diversity is good, allyship is good, but um, the important thing is how do you make all of this in feel included? So as an example, you might care about diversity in a conference, might make sure, okay, like, you know, okay, we need diverse candidates, so let's, let's open a diversity scholarship, but in the end, if there is like an after party with all drinks and if, if like and if somebody is not comfortable with this, then your after party is broken. So the people who don't feel included there will never participate. So that's the first thing. Or just with the catering options, if, if the food is like not good, people will not be included there. So I think what's more important is um, giving people the feeling of inclusion. So this also um, includes um, giving a feeling of inclusion even to people who identify themselves as white, white male or white female. So it's, it's not a person's fault for having born that way or you know having turned out to be that way. So it's, it's good, allyship is good, it's good. Okay, when you talk about allyship, you care about diversity, but what's more important is executing how inclusion is implemented and making sure that's executed the right way. So, and for this, just starting with communication, just broadening your mindset, I think that that's the first step to begin with, just to identify that each one of us is different and each one of us can have our own personal preferences and starting to think that direction can be a Great starting pointer. Thank you. <clears throat> Jessica, do you have? I just say if anyone is uh, in Berlin permanently, you can come to our open source diversity meetups and support as coaches, or you can help us find co uh, a host space. Uh, there's lots of ways to support us. Um, if you don't feel comfortable with any of those ways, but you have some extra income, you can also support various groups, not just open source diversity, uh, with money because, you know, that gets you a lot of places. Yeah, and it's also maybe worth saying that, like, I think on the website of open source diversity, there's, like, an overview of, like, resources and programs and different things that, that, yeah, that we share there, so, um. It's, yeah, maybe also worth people checking that out, uh, checking out the website. Cool, thank you. Uh, you asked for some wisdom. I don't show, I'm not sure I can do that. <laughs> but uh, I wanted to mention that uh, Nextcloud, that we have a, a program called Nextcloud Include, nextcloud.com slash include, where you can, um, people, uh, underrepresented group can apply for um, uh, travel support, mentorships, and, and other things um, to become part of the community. And I want to encourage everybody to apply if you're in the live stream or in the room. Or if you know someone, recommend, uh, suggest to apply. And um, yeah, so I hope that we can um, have a better, a better diverse community here uh, next year. Yeah, maybe following uh, Jessica's suggestion also of bringing plus ones. I actually quite like that idea. <laughs> cool. Thank you.
Yeah.